Thank you, Brother Kilgore. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. And all of my friends said, Praise the Lord. You know, sitting back there tonight, I could honestly say that I felt a spirit of total comfort. And I say that sincerely because it just dawned upon me afresh and anew that I was in the house of my friends. I could look around this arena, and though there are literally thousands of people here, and many of you I don't know, I couldn't look over 10 or 15 people anywhere and not see someone that I personally knew. And then by spirit, I know all of you because we have the same father and the same mother. You're my brothers and sisters. I'm in the house of my friends tonight. Hallelujah. And I certainly hope that it won't be said of me as it was of our Lord that I was wounded in the house of my friends. And I don't believe that that will be the case. There's a tremendous Spirit of God here tonight, and I praise Him for ever bringing me into the tremendous family of God. Hallelujah. This is the bicentennial year. We've talked so much about the spirit of 76. Seven is God's number. Six is man's number. And I think it's almost ironic. Seven, six. God, man. If somehow we can get that unique combination working here tonight. God and man. The true spirit of seven to six will prevail. I'm glad the seven comes first. But I want the spirit of God to mix with the spirit of men here tonight and somehow homogenize us that we might flow as tributaries into the mighty Mississippi of God's will and leave here changed and blessed by the Holy Spirit. Behind us, you can read it on the caption, The Spirit Speaketh Expressly. The word expressly means distinctly. And I think that the Spirit is sounding forth a distinct voice in 76. And I personally want to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. Would everybody just lift a hand and say, Speak to me, Lord. Speak to me. Dear Lord, not just to us, but speak to me. Let God and man be homogenized here tonight, O Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Ghost flow and help us to open the channels that you might flow through us. Humanistic vessels, though we are, flow through us, O Spirit of God. Speak to us. God bless you, my friends. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles tonight, and I know that you do, and will turn with me to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 9. And in this ninth division of Second Kings, we will begin with verse 1. And Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophets and said unto him, Gird up thy loins, and take this box of oil in thine hand, and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when thou comest to thither, look out there Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshai, and go in and make him arise up from among his brethren and carry him into an inner chamber. Then take the box of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and tarry not. So the young man, even the young man of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead, 
And when he came, behold, the captains of the host were sitting. And he said, I have an errand unto thee, O captain. And Jehu said, Unto which of us? And he said, Unto thee, O captain. And then in 2 Kings 9, beginning with verse 16, So Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel, for Jehoram lay there, and Ahiza, king of Judah, was come down to see him. And there stood a watchman on the tower of Jezreel, and he spied the company of Jehu as he came. And he said, I see a company. And Jehoram said, Take a horseman and send to meet them, and let him say, Is it peace? So there went one on horseback to meet him and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu said, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told him, saying, The messenger came to him, that he cometh not again. Then he sent out a second on horseback, which came to them and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu answered, What? Hast thou to do with peace, turn thee behind me. There are two identical phrases found in verses 18 and 19 of 2 Kings 9. The same question is asked by the messenger of the king. The same answer is given by Jehu. The messenger said, Have you come in peace? Jehu said, What do you know about peace? Turn thee behind me in verse 18. And then the identical phrase is reiterated in the next verse. Turn thee behind me. One translation says, swing around behind me. Another translation says, turn around behind me. And my subject tonight is this, the turn around. The turn around. That's right. The turn around. Will you say that with me? The turn around. Say it again. The turn around. And oh Lord, let something happen to me tonight. And if I need it, turn me around. The time of upheaval and stress in Israel and Judah. Ahazah was king of Judah. Jehoram was king of Israel, and actually the old queen mother Jezebel was pulling the strings. Tremendous adversity and problems were rampant throughout Israel and Judah. There was a great spirit of unrest. The people were turning to the right and to the left. Disturbance ran rampant throughout the land. And God sent upon the scene a man that had some kind of an experience that caused him to become a turnaround point for a generation that had lost its way and was in the throes of despair. And very honestly tonight, whatever it was, that that man Jehu had that caused him to be a turnaround point for a world in need, for a world that had lost its way, for a world that was seeking for direction, for a world that had set its course for a head-on collision with God. Whatever it was that that man possessed that made him become a turnaround point, Dear Lord, I want it tonight. I don't think that I need to draw a striking 
parallel to remind you that our world today is in a chaotic condition, that the spirit of revolution and rebellion is running throughout the land. You know, really, I'm not a calamity howler and I'm not a pessimist and I'm not here to give a bunch of stale statistics to indicate that the dikes are down and this generation is about to be submerged in a hellish tide of impurity. You already know that. I don't think the church has come into the world to curse the darkness, but I believe we have been sent to turn on the light. Yeah. Hallelujah! Yeah. And automatically when we turn on the light, the darkness flees, for the darkness comprehendeth not the light. And we serve one who said, I am the light of the world. And he sent us forth with this commission, ye are the light of the world. But this man had some kind of an experience in the midst of the darkness of his day and the destructive elements of his day that made him become a turnaround point. And everybody that hit him turned around and rode behind him. And the enemies of God that had been sent to destroy him, he converted them on the spot and made them tremendous warriors in the army of God. And let me drill it in, Lord, whatever he had, I want it. Because I want to be a turnaround point for men who are in darkness tonight. You know, actually, destruction and rebellion began in heaven. God had three archangels, Gabriel, Michael, and Lucifer. Lucifer's name means the son of the morning or the son of light. It could be that he had charge of God's lighting system. What an exalted position Lucifer had to have charge of the sun and the moon and the stars, but rebellion in his heart. And he decided that he would exalt his throne above God's throne. Now the book of God says in Ezekiel 28 that he was an anointed cherub. Amen. The man had an anointing. The angelic being had an anointing, but it became a perverted anointing. And he used it to turn angels around and to detract from God and attract to himself. Satan, Lucifer, with his anointing, his perverted anointing, became a turnaround point for a third of the angels of heaven, and they followed him in his revolution. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And lightning travels at a rate of speed of 28,500 miles per second. That's how long it took God to get rid of sin and rebellion in heaven. Oh, hallelujah. And a third of the angels fell with him because of a perverted anointing, a destructive anointing. I believe that today God has started a new revolution. God has started a new revolution. I'm not arguing with the revolution that the devil's got going. Every one of you know that the devil's got a revolution going. A revolution of hate and a revolution of agnosticism and a revolution of rebellion and a revolution of iniquity and a revolution of darkness. But I'm here to tell you that God has launched in these last days a, a counter-revolution. And somehow I hear the master, I hear our majestic general uh, as he blows the bugle uh, a charge from the ramparts of glory and declares upon this rock, uh, I will build my church uh, and the gates uh, of a hell uh, shall not uh, prevail against it. God has started a revolution of creativity. God has started a revolution of power. God has started a revolution of grace. God has started a revolution of love. He said in Acts 1 and 8, ye shall receive dynamite after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And God's dynamite is not destructive dynamite. It is creative dynamite. And he set the church in the world 
to meet the counterfeit anointing of Satan that turned so many people around and perverted their minds. And he set this church beautiful for situation to turn the world around and ride behind King Jesus. To take some of these enemies of God and make friends out of them. Some in darkness and turn them to children of light. Some on their way to hell and make them fit subjects for heaven. He has set the church as a turnaround point. Hear me again. To turn men and women around to ride behind King Jesus. Now, in this scripture... Elisha felt an anointing. Holy Ghost said, send down to Ramoth Gilead and anoint a new king. Now, they already had two kings, and both of them were backslidden. And this king is going to turn the nation of Israel and Judah around. So, he said, all right. And he said, here, servant, take this box of oil. And when you get there, get Jehu off in a secret chamber, anoint him, and then he said, run. Don't stay around to get any glory for yourself. Just do your work and run. He said, all right. So the Bible said he went in to Ramoth Gilead, and the captains of the army, now the captains, mind you, of the king of Israel and Judah's army were sitting in a circle, talking, sitting, apathy had taken hold of Israel. They had just sat down as captains in the Lord's army and folded their hands and crossed their holy knees and arched their ecclesiastical eyebrows and said, well, it's no use. It's all over. Ahab and Azariah are in control and, and, and Jezebel's are pulling all the strings and we may as well forget it. It's all over. Total apathy had set in to the army of God and they were sitting down when their nation was perishing and languishing in the lap of two foul cohorts of Lucifer himself. They were sitting down, did you hear me, in apathy in a little circle, maybe polishing their own halos and hanging garlands of success around their own necks and talking about us and our little circle and what we've got and how dark it is on the outside. But suddenly into this room came a madman. Now the Bible said he acted like a madman. Can you imagine a few of us sitting on this platform talking about the terrible affairs of the world and how bad the world was in and maybe even talking a little bit about what was going on in the church that we didn't like. And all of a sudden, a fella comes running up on the platform and said, I got a message. They'd never laid eyes on him before. He just runs in with a box under his arm. I got a message. And he looked wild in his eyes. They called him a madman. You know what the word mad means? It means nuts. It means crazy. Hallelujah. And he came running in. And he said, I got a message for one of you. And they said, which one of us? He said, you. He said, well, give it to me. He said, no, come, come with me. And he took him into an inner chamber. And he broke open that box and took out some oil and started pouring it on him. And he said, thus saith the Lord. I'm anointing you king of Israel and Judah, and you're going to go down and destroy the house of Ahab and turn the hearts of God's people back to him. And you're going to destroy the prophets of Baal, and you're going to destroy both of the wicked kings, and you're going to destroy Jezebel, and the dogs are going to lick her blood, and there's not going to be enough of her to bury. You're going to do it all! And when he said that, he slammed the door and ran out. Jehu came out of the room 
with the oil dripping all over him. Now listen, they didn't dab them in those days like we do. If I interpret the scriptures in the 30th chapter of Exodus correctly, they anointed them with one and a half gallons, six quarts. Boy, wasn't any little dab of anointing he got. He got a gallon and a half. And can you imagine a man coming out of the room with a gallon and a half of oil running all over him? And his friends looked at him and said, what did that mad man want? That's what they said. Read it. What did that nut want anyhow? And you know what he said? He said, oh, it was nothing. <laughs> Trying to act casual when the anointing of a gallon and a half of oil was running all over him and trying to act like nothing happened in that inner chamber. Nothing happened to me, not a thing. I'm the same man that, that came out, that went in, and they looked at him and they said, now come on, you tell us the truth. Uh, we can look at you and tell that something happened to you in that room without a while, fella. You see, he looked different. Now when you get home, you can check why he looked different. In the 30th chapter of Exodus, verse 23 and 24, it tells us what this anointing oil was made of. It had five-fold ingredients. It had myrrh, cinnamon, calamus, cassia, and olive. And it was at least a gallon and a half. And according to Exodus 30, it cost between 1,500 and 2,000 shekels, which on today's market would be between 1,000 and 2,000 dollars. Well, here comes a man out with a $2,000 anointing and six quarts of oil running all over him and smelling up the whole room with his anointing and trying to act like nothing happened to me. Brother, everybody in that room knew that something had happened in that inner chamber that had changed his life. Oh, God, lead us to that inner chamber. Lead us to that inner chamber. Lead us to that closet of prayer. And, oh, God, give us that holy anointing and enough of it to, to change our lives and make us a turnaround point for everybody we touch. A $2,000 gallon and a half anointing, and he said nothing happened. Well, now, I'm not going to bore in too much on this, but he looked anointed, he was acting anointed, and he smelled anointed. Because it was a five-fold anointing. Hallelujah. And any old discerning priest could have sniffed him and said, well, you got four ingredients in there, but there's one missing. Where's the cassia? Where's the cinnamon? Where's the calamus? But no, sir, when they sniffed of him, they knew he had it all. Hallelujah. And the anointing that we need today is the five-fold anointing of the five-fold ministry to turn this world around. Oh, hallelujah and cause them to ride behind Jesus. Now, I'm not talking about whether we actually have apostles or prophets. I could talk about that. But God knows we've got to have the apostolic anointing. We've got to have the prophetic anointing. We've got to have anointed pastors and anointed evangelists and anointed teachers. It's got to look apostolic. It's got to talk apostolic. It's got to smell apostolic. If we're going to turn the world around, Oh, hallelujah. Give it to me, Lord. 
word, uh, the first ingredient, uh, the second ingredient, uh, the third ingredient, uh, the fourth ingredient. Uh, Lord, uh, give me a gallon uh, and a half uh, of anointing uh, in these last days so that I can become a turnaround point. He had been to a secret place. It hit him. Others questioned him. And he had to admit. He said, all right, now you tell us. Tell us exactly what's happened. He said, you really want to know what he said? Yeah. Well, he poured all, all over me. And then he said, thus saith the Lord. Now here's just a room full of little peon captains. Nobodies, ordinaries. Said he anointed me. And he said, God had chosen me to be king. And that he is going to overthrow Jehoram and Hezariah. And he's going to destroy Jezebel. And there's going to come a revival to Israel. Such as they've never known. Now he just told them that wild story. And all of a sudden they jumped up. Somebody said, give me a trumpet. And that little handful of ordinary people went to blowing the trumpet and shouting in Ramoth Gilead, God has anointed Jehu King. And they thought, if he's a king, if he's a king, he's going to have to have a throne. And they didn't have a throne. So they went up to the top of the ordinary stairs and they all took their coats off and laid their coats down one by one. And they said, come on, Jehu. And that ordinary man climbed those ordinary stairs and sat down on the ordinary coats of ordinary men and they proclaimed him anointed of God and the turnaround point for all of Israel and Judah. Do you mean to tell me you're going to turn Israel around? Yes. You mean to tell me you and your little uh, mongrel group is going to bring revival to Israel? Yes. All right. Jehu, how much money do you have to launch your warfare? Don't have any money. How much education have you got? Don't have any education. Uh, what about the royal lineage? Don't have any royal lineage. Uh, how big an army do you have? Just have a handful of men. Well, what do you have that's going to turn Israel around? All I've got is the anointing. The anointing. The anointing. That's all I've got is the anointing. Oh, hallelujah. I got alone in an inner chamber and a mysterious man came in and he anointed me and he said, that I was going to do it. That's all I've got. Do you hear me, brethren? That's all we've got. We don't have the money. We don't have the personality. We don't have the education. We don't have the numbers. But thank God for the fivefold anointing that God has endowed this church with. Ordinary men took off ordinary coats and elevated a man by ordinary stairs. Hallelujah. You know what they said when they put their coats under that man? We are coming under your authority. Saints, laity, Ordinary people, God will raise up in your congregation an ordinary pastor. If you will lay your coats under him and come under subjection to him, there is no telling what kind of revival that God can bring through ordinary folks that's following an ordinary man that's got an extraordinary anointing. And they blew the trumpet and they said, we're going to follow him because we believe he's got it. Amen. 
and that he can become the turnaround point. How foolish it looked. How ridiculous it looked. How extraordinary it looked. How impossible it looked. Hear me and believe me when I tell you the only weapon the man had was the anointing. And the cooperation of a few who believed in him. And he said, all right, don't tell anybody. I'll do it. And the Bible said he rolled furiously. And we, we laugh up about that. Old Jehu, old so-and-so drives like Jehu. He was driving furiously. You know why he was driving furiously? He was trying to get ahead of a rumor. And brother, you've got to have a jet today to get ahead of a rumor. He said, I don't want to talk in Samaria till I get there. So he drove furiously to get ahead of the rumor. Pray he wanted to be the one to let the king know that he was anointed. So he started riding. Old King was there licking his wounds. Old King Ahazi. Somebody came and told him, said, look, there's some fellow with a company riding toward the city said they're driving furiously and he said well send somebody out send one of my trusted servants out now you know he didn't just send any peon out you send one of my trusted servants and ask him if he's come in peace so they sent a man out he went loping out and he ran in to the anointed Jehu. And I can see him as he looked at him. Can you imagine what the dust had done to that oil by that time? And how that garment looked by that time. How that dust had caught in it. Amen. And a bunch of men screaming behind him, Jehu, the anointed king! Jehu! I can hear him say, Jehu! You mean Jehu rolls with harvest time? No, not Jehu. Jehu. Hey, man, he's been anointed king. And the little servant, the trusted servant of the king, looked at him and he said, Are you coming, peace? And Jehu looked down at him and said, What do you know about peace? If you will turn around and ride with me, I'll show you what peace is and what of God that turned an enemy around and made him ride with the armies of God. And there's some enemies out there. There's some in the devil's army that would make mighty good warriors in the army of King Jesus if we can ride out to meet them and turn them around and get them behind us. Hmm. Well... King said, say, but that fellow I sent out. Watchman said, well, he went out, but he didn't come back. He said, well, send another one. And he sent another one with the same message. And he went loping out. And old J. Hugh still driving furiously. He didn't let up. And here comes the second servant of the king. Trusted man, maybe a general, I don't know. And he looked at J. Hugh who with that blotched face and the rivulets like mud and oil running down his countenance. Hey, can you imagine what his beard looked like? Hey, Amen. And his cloak almost stiff as the oil mixed with the sweat and with the wind and with the mud. Oh, and he said, are you coming? Peace. And Jay, you said, what do you know about peace? You turn around and ride with me and I'll show you what peace is. What? It hit him too. He said, yes, sir. And he turned around. He was converted on the spot and started riding behind Jehu. Jehu became a turnaround point. Hallelujah. Watchman said, oh, king. Yeah. Second fellow went out. Yeah. He didn't come back. Did you notice that Jehu, the closer he got to the king, never altered his message? The closer he got to the central power of error and wickedness, he never changed. 
same message. The closer he got to the showdown, and he knew that down the road you're going to meet the king himself. And the closer he got to the showdown, the more he bore down on the same old message. He could have said, I love you, King, and you're just a guy that needs a little and the Lord will split the kingdom, and I'll let him have a province, and I'll take a province he's nothing doing. What do you know about peace? If you want to be on the winning side, you better swing around and ride. Let me tell you something, church. We get down to the finish line. The more opportunities we are going to have to talk about our message, and the more voices we're going to hear that will tell us that there are other ways to get the job done, and that the old-fashioned gospel is not necessary. I wrestled with a man for two or three hours just this past week that confessed, Brother Timmy, I am so confused. So many people he spoke of in the world and in denominational churches that are talking in tongues. And he said, I see things in their midst and I'm wondering. I said, Brother, let me tell you something. I am not denying anything that God is doing anywhere. But let me assure you of this. The Bible said in the 28th of Isaiah, with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak. And that's a wonderful thing, but it doesn't stop there. He said, what do you mean? I said, the rest of that verse said, line must be upon line and precept upon precept. Oh, hallelujah. I thank God if you've got a charismatic or a tongue-talking experience, but brother, line's got to be on line and precepts got to be on precepts. It's still in the book. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn around. Turn around. Turn around. There's an anointing in that name. Turn around. There's an anointing in that one God message. Turn around and ride with us. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men. The name of Jesus is a turnaround point. Oh, yeah. The closer we get to the end, the more opportunities we're going to get to compromise. Did you know that just before Moses and the children of Israel got out of Egypt, they had the greatest opportunities to compromise and the most pressure to compromise. And parallel with that, they had the greatest manifestation of supernatural power in their midst just before they got out. And that tells me something. Just before the church gets out, we're going to meet our greatest opposition and opportunities to compromise. And at the same time, we're going to have our greatest manifestations of supernatural apostolic power. And if we don't compromise, we get the power. All right now, Jehu, you're already anointed for king, but you're not king yet, and you're not going to be if you compromise. And we've got the anointing of the apostolic message, but we're not crowned yet. We're in his kingdom, but he hasn't made up his bride yet. But if we're right on, without compromise, we're riding for the city... Israel in Egypt 
Oh, Moses goes to Pharaoh. God said, let my people go. Pharaoh said in our colloquial southern English, I ain't going to do it. Moses said, you'll be sorry. I'm not going to do it. He said, all right. All the water's going to turn to blood. <laughs> Pharaoh got up and went down to bathe the next day. Ah! If they'd have had running water, his wife went in, turned the tap. Ah! Blood. And I can see her running into the throne room. Darling, there's blood where there's supposed to be water. He said, it's that nutty preacher. He's crazy. I'm telling you, the man is crazy. Moses came in. Yes, sir, what you want? This water turned to blood. Pharaoh said, let my people go. He said, I'm not going to do it. He said, all right. You're going to sleep with life tonight. Life, he is nutty as a fruitcake. He thinks all this is going to happen in my eminent domain. And I can see him as he went to bed and blew out the candle. <laughs> Trying to sleep. <laughs> I can hear his wife punch him. What's the matter? <laughs> I don't know. Something in this bed. She I feel something in my hair. <laughs> Call the chamberlain. Get up, quick, turn on, uh, get, get the candle in. And last. Ooh, just tell about that crazy preacher again. Moses! Yes, king. Let my people go. If you don't, you're going to be sorry. He said, all right, now look. Let me, let's be reasonable. You can go but sacrifice in the land. Let your group be a part of Egypt, and you can still be religious. Worldly Christians make about as much sense as heavenly devils. You know, be religious, but mix with the world. Keep staying, stay connected with Egypt. <laughs> he said, we're not going to do it. Pharaoh said, I'm not going to let you go. You're going to be sorry. <sighs> and the next morning when his wife got up and opened the kettle to get the flour for the biscuits, frogs started jumping out. And she opened the ovens and frogs started jumping out. And she threw back the covers and it was frogs. Pharaoh! And he comes running in a palace and filled with frogs. There's frogs everywhere! It's that crazy preacher, Moses! Moses comes in. God said, let my people go. He hadn't changed his message. I don't care how much pressure. Let my people go. You're not going to be very popular in the court. Let my people go. Pharaoh's not going to like it. Let my people go. Pharaoh said, all right, you can go, but don't go too far. Go ahead and be Pentecostal, but don't go overboard. There's a lot of things you people go too far with. You go too far. A lot of things you believe that you just go too far with. You don't have to run the aisle. said, you're not going to do it. You'll be sorry. And that night, oh, oh, and the word came, all the cattle in Egypt have died. You're wiped out. 
What about the Israelites' cows? They're grazing in the meadows. <laughs> Their message is a message of life. Moses! Yes, sir. Let my people go. Okay. You can go. But who's going with you? And the connotation is, leave your children here. You know, there's a lot of people that will go as far as they're supposed to go themselves, but they'll excuse their children. And that is the sin of Eli, who became a fat, egotistical toad squatting on the thumb of a nation, fell off a wall and broke his neck because he allowed things in his children that he condemned in his own heart. You go ahead, but don't make your kids go that far. Moses said, we're all going lock, stock, and barrel. We're not going to lose our children. And listen to me, perverted 20th century. Listen to the class. Without compromise. Right. Say you did. Mighty right he did. He didn't compromise. The next time the king spoke, he said, Watchman said, that second fellow you sent out, he, he didn't come back either. Jehu and his anointing was a turnaround point because of his uncompromising stand. The king said, I'll go myself. Get my chariot. And brother, before we get out of here, we're going to meet King Devil himself. He's going to come down to earth. He's been sending emissaries, and many times we say, I met the devil. I do not believe personally the devil is omnipresent. I believe only God is. What we usually meet is one of his agents or demons. But before it's over with, we're going to run slap into him. And we'd better make sure that that anointed cherub's anointing is below our anointing. We'd better be sure that we've got the full orbed apostolic anointing when we meet the anointed cherub, Lucifer. Because remember, he turned a third of the angels of heaven around. And he set his course, and I say this in the Holy Ghost, to turn the United Pentecostal Church around and turn us into a nice little comfortable cult that will be rocked to sleep in the devil's cradle of materialism and lethargy and prosperity until we'll settle down on our knees and gather around like Jehu's captains and settle the king came riding out. The king screamed out with the same message. Are you come in peace? And old Jehu saw him. He said, let me tell you something. There'll be no peace as long as the whoredoms and the witchcraft of your mother Jezebel is in the land and I am dedicated to destroy her and he was not converted but he was killed I'm going to tell you what we're going to have to do we're going to have to start banding together and instead of praying for things we're going to have to start praying against them Did you know there's powers in this church to bind things? Amen. We sit back and let the devil beat us half to death when there is resident in the authority of this gospel the power to bind. Oh, the king screamed, it's a trap! Then he turned around and started riding away, running in power from the man with the anointing. Did you know that the Bible said that if you will resist the devil, he will flee? Hallelujah. 
submit thyself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee. And the word flee, look it up in your dictionary. It doesn't just mean run. It means run in fear. The devil is running scared when he unleashes the anointed man in the chaps. Oh, God, anoint every pastor. God, anoint every evangelist. God, anoint our leaders. God, anoint our saints. And they drew a bow, a wang, whop, and it knocked the heart out of the wicked king. We may as well go for the heart of iniquity and sin tonight. Knocked his heart out. He didn't fool around cutting his th fingers or nicking his forehead. He didn't fool around with switches and belts. Raise a few whips on him. He threw an anointing at him that knocked his heart out. He wasn't converted. He was killed. And there's power in this gospel to kill or to make alive. To convert or condemn. To build or tear down. What a powerful gospel. Well, you can stop there. No, sir. He went ahead to kill Ahijah, the king of Israel. He killed 70 princes of Samaria. He killed 42 of the king of Judah's kin. He rounded up a thousand of the prophets of Baal in the temple and slew the last one of them. He made a clean sweep. He didn't stop till he cleaned Israel up. Put death to everything that was error and began to set it aright. And the prophet of God came and said, because of what you've done, your sons are going to reign on the throne to the fourth generation. I'm going to send you, Jehu, a fourth generation revival because you had the intestinal fortitude to clean Israel up and to have revival in the land. You heard Sister Marilyn Gazowski the other night talk about being a fourth generation. Her grandmother was Pentecostal. Her mother was Pentecostal. She's Pentecostal. Her son that sang was Pentecostal. Did you ever stop to think that we are living in the fourth generation? Hallelujah, since Azusa Street and the turn of the century outpouring, this is the fourth generation. And I believe if we will refuse to compromise in this fourth generation, just before we get out of this world, we're going to have a revival in the fourth generation. name of Jesus, a, a revival of Holy Ghost power, a revival of uncompromising holiness. He went on into the city. He was cleaning up the whole thing. And they ran and told Jezebel. And she was r really the queen mother. They said, he's a coming. And that old wrinkled face, I would call her a bat, Brother Cooling, but I'm not. Painted her face. You know why we don't paint our faces, ladies? Because it's in bad company every time you find it in the Bible. Bad company. And she fixed her hairdo and she went. And she looked down from the balcony and as he came in, Jehu! She thought she'd seduce him like she had the rest and wrap him around her finger. Yeah, he's met every anointing but mine. He's never met mine. And I don't guess there's anything any meaner than the devil than the devil's mother-in-law. Amen. Hallelujah. Jehu. 
and he looked up and he said, Say, is there anybody up there on my side? Anybody up there on the Lord's side? And three old eunuchs stuck their head out the window. All still unproductive eunuchs. Who'd ever expect anything out of them? They stuck their head out and they said, We are. Said, Get a hold of us and pour it out. He'd have never thought he could have used anything like that. But, brother, the anointing was flowing. And the revival continued. Hallelujah. The kings are dead and, and the enemies are dying. Hallelujah. And I got a promise of a fourth generation revival and mighty power. If I won't compromise, if I'll hold on, I'm going to be used of God to turn all of Israel around. So he sent a letter to the elders of Samaria and said, Say, you've got 70 princes there, 70 sons of Ahab. Why don't you anoint one of them as king? They said, that anointing hit them. Oh, they wrote him back. They said, we not anoint nobody king. We're going to follow you, Jehu. You mean you're not going to split off and anoint one of them king up there in Samaria and let me be king down here? No. We're not going to have two kings because we recognize that God's single anointing is flowing through all of Israel. And we want to be a part of what the unified Israel is doing. Now, they had an opportunity to do it, and they could have done it. They were strong enough to do it. But they chose of their own volition. No, sir, we're going to humble ourselves and ride behind you because we believe you know where you're going. And do you know what I believe? I believe this church is on course, and we know where we're going. Did you ever stop to think... Now fasten your seat belts and put on your crash helmets. There has never been a split in hell. You never hear of 50 little demons splitting off from the devil to start a new hell. They are unified in their purpose to follow the devil and to do his bidding and his work. They are regimented and they ride behind him. United Pentecostal Church, let us never lose our spirit of regimentation and our spirit of unity and our spirit of unanimity that we're all together. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. You may say, Brother Timmy, we're all different. We're not cookie cutters. And we're not a bunch of stereotype preachers. And the marvel of it all is the unity of our diversity. Oh, that's the marvel of it. You know what unifies us? It's the sniff and the smell of that fivefold anointing. We all want to smell alike. Praise God. We may not look alike and we may not act alike, but we all want to smell like genuine thoroughbred, apostolic, Pentecostal, one God, ten token. If ever I wanted to march with this people, I wanted to march with them today. I want this fourth generation revival. You know, sometimes we've got more faith in what we lost in the first Adam than we have faith in what we regained in the second Adam. Why do we die? Oh, because Adam sinned. Why do you get sick? Oh, because Adam sinned. Why are the thorns and thistles? Oh, because Adam sinned. Why is there so much trouble? Oh, because Adam sinned. Did you know that everything you lost 
in the first Adam and everything you've got so much faith for that you lost in the first Adam, you regained in the second Adam. Oh, hallelujah. He purchased for me on Calvary life. He purchased for me healing. He purchased for me power. He that's in you is greater than he that is in the world. Turn around, turn around, turn around and ride behind King Jesus. You may find that your Pentecostal experience leads not to a revival, but first to satanic opposition. Jay, you met all kind of opposition before he met revival, and we hear all kind of voices today. We need to do this. We need to do that. Somebody said we need to dismantle the organization. Let me tell you something, friend. There's nothing wrong with the plumbing. We just need the water flowing. <laughs> Hallelujah. We are set up as a base for world evangelization. If we will follow after the anointing and ride behind the king and stay together, hallelujah, and keep Israel clean and keep our objectives straight ahead, we can become the turnaround point. But let me tell you something, United Pentecostal Church. And if I'm wrong, somebody, somewhere, turn me around. If I don't know what I'm talking about, then somebody with an anointing strike me and turn me around because I want to be touched. I came to this conference hungry for God. I came feeling the cross currents and the cross winds of compromise that are blowing in the world. In my pastorate, I fight the same things you do. I know where you evangelists are. We've come to the place where two seas meet and we're hearing strange voices that speak to us, that are telling us that many things that we have held to are not really necessary. And that we'd better adjust to this culture or we're going to be sidetracked and that we don't need to tenaciously hold on to some of the tenants that have marked us great as a people. I hear it. I feel the subtle pressure. And if you see anything in me that would look like I'm deviating from the path that's made us what we are, will somebody turn me around? Brother Weeks, will you turn me around? Brother Kilgore, turn me around. Elder Cook, turn me around. I'm a product of your church. I wasn't born in the United Pentecostal Church. I was in my mid-teens the first time I ever walked into the hallowed sanctuary of one of your edifices. The man that baptized me in Jesus' name preached to you just night before last. I didn't know anything about your doctrines and truths. You taught me what I know. You've made me what I am. You've led me to the place that I've come to tonight. If I'm wrong now, I've been wrong for 27 years. If I'm wrong now, I've been wrong all the way down the line and somebody turned it around. If ever there was a day that we'd better hold on and ride furiously. But then you just don't understand the intelligent age we're living in and people are just different today and they don't understand us they never have you think they understood Jehu with his dusty anointing it wasn't what they understood it was what they felt what? I didn't understand anything about you when I walked in on you United Pentecostal Church The first time I ever walked through the doors of a UPC church, it was to pick somebody up after a service was over. And a man who's in this congregation tonight, I just happened to be standing at the back, and at the front of the pew, he was long and tall. He fell across four pews, not down them, across them. And the power of God hit him, and he started coming over them. Just like that, a crawling. 
and I was petrified. And when he got to me, he rolled off, fell off the end, and fell flat on the floor, face up, looking at me, talking in tongues. That was my introduction to Pentecost. Oh, hallelujah. But there was something in me that said, what meaneth this? What meaneth this? I didn't understand that dress. I didn't understand that wrong hair. I didn't understand that doctrine. But something got a hold of me. I felt that anointing. There's some things, whether you understand them or not, that just mark us as God's people. And if we let down there, the world's going to think that we're wrong all the way. I had a lady recently question me about the modesty of a particular piece of apparel. And she was arguing with me that that was more modest than a dress. And I said, now let me tell you something. You've born and reared in this country, yes. You've known Pentecostal people all their life, yes. What would the people you work with think of you? Forget the Bible. Just forget it. What would they think of you if you came out on the job dressed like that? She said, well, she dropped her head. She said, they all know Pentecostal people don't do that. I said, let me tell you something. Even if you're right in what you're saying, they would say in their heart, if you people have been wrong on that line all these years, then maybe everything else you've preached. And if for no other reason to hold up the integrity of what we have always held as sacred, we're not going to leave a hoof behind. Yeah, we're not going to leave a hoof behind. I want them to look at us and say they look Pentecostal, they walk Pentecostal, they dress Pentecostal, and they smell apostolic! Can you see a man in Israel? Look at a man in Israel. He's out there plowing with one ox, and he's got his wife on the other side of the yoke, just trying to hold up the yoke. And his Gentile neighbor looks at him and says, Josiah, what are you doing with your wife on the other end of that yoke? Well, my other ox is sick. <laughs> well, look, you got a donkey. Why don't you go put that donkey on just to hold up the yoke? You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Oh, I can't do that. What? I can't put that donkey on the other end of that yoke where that oxen is. Well, why? Well, because the priest said that the Word of God said that we can't plow an ox and an ass together. Well, Josiah, tell me why. I don't understand that. I don't know why. The book just says it, and I ain't going to do it. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. That's something that marks us different. Well, you sure are queer. I'll hear you. I can see old Josiah a planting a row of corn. And then he goes way over the hill to plant one row of flax. And his neighbor says, Josiah, why in the world are you going all the way over yonder to plant one row of flax? Why don't you plant it here next to that corn? Well, I tell you what, the priest said that the word of God said we can't close to these kind of guys to speak together. What? That doesn't make sense. Why? Well, I wish I can't tell you why, but it's in the book, and I'm not going to do it. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, and I'll tell you something else. My wife's in yonder with some cotton yarn, and she's run out, and she can't even go down and get the Well, the same priest told us the Word of God said we can't mix divers kinds of breads and garments. And because it says it, we're not going to do it. They did it just to mark them distinctly as God's people. I know no other reason for it. I can't figure out why God's people just didn't do it. To obey God, they didn't do it. Now, you ladies, let me tell you why you got to have long hair. I can't explain it to you, but it just marks you as separate from the world.
But somebody else says, what's the difference in that and this? And then somebody in this area, what's the difference in that and this? You need to give the more earnest heed to the things which you've heard, lest at any time you let them slip. One translation says you let them drift. And the connotation there of drifting is a ship that's been securely tied to a mooring and somebody in the night has reached up and slipped the rope. And while everybody aboard was sleeping in the night, slowly, almost unnoticed as the tide goes out, the ship begins to drift, drift, slowly, subtly, a drift, not a hasty repeat or retreat, not the motors revved, not the oars plucking and splashing, but just a slow, subtle drift until in the morning the captain and those aboard wake up and they're way out to sea and they've drifted so subtly and slowly that they didn't know it just because somebody loosed one mooring and let them drift. And he said, you need to give the more earnest heed to the things that you've heard lest at any time you let them drift, drift. And when I hear this, what's the difference in? And let's re-examine it. Let's talk in a little of this is not wrong. I hear the words. We've come to the place where two seas meet and there's a drift. A drift. Brother Teddy, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm not alone in feeling this. And if I am, somebody turn me around. But I feel it. I feel it in my church. I feel it in my pulpit. I conference. Our general superintendent felt it because he read a letter to us in the minister's meeting warning us of some drifts that he was seeing. Our assistant general superintendent talked to us about a drift away from brotherhood and love and mutual concern. Our brother Pugh stood here and said if we're not careful, we're going to fall in on ourselves and become wandering stars drifting, 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 drifting. Drifting, drifting, drifting. Your home missions program called us back to the basics. Back to the basics. Back to the basics. Voice after voice in this pulpit have warned us. Turn around. Turn around. Turn around! You're drifting! And it's so subtle. And it's materialism. It's prosperity. And we're drifting. We can do things now we couldn't afford to do years ago. Then did we ever have convictions years ago? We're drifting. We're drifting. We're drifting. I'm not talking about going back to Pentecost 40 or 50 years ago, but if you want to talk about turning around and an anointing that will take us back, let's go all the way back to that early church. Hallelujah. And let's look at our original moorings, not our moorings of 50 years ago, 
so let's go back to the book of Acts. And the Bible said they prayed and they fasted and they broke bread and they had all things in common. And the Bible said with singleness of heart they craved to the word of God. And the Bible said as they prayed the Holy Ghost shook the place. Oh my friend, it did not say as they organized or as they appointed committees, but as they prayed the Holy Ghost came down and it shook the place and it shook the place and they went out to die like Stephen and to evangelize like Philip. Oh, United Pentecostal Church, turn around, turn around, lead me back to the old-fashioned altars. Lead me back to the hours of prayer. Lead me back to mutual love and concern for my brothers. Lead me back to a renewed respect for the advice of my elders. Lead me back. I don't want to drift. <laughs> Take me back to that council at Jerusalem where godly men could get together and render holy decisions that would turn the church around and they said, we'll ride in that direction. We'll go with you. Take me back. Take me back. Oh, God. We talk about last day revival and last day power. Hear this preacher tonight. Hear my heart. If my words are not making sense. We talk about what's wrong with our people. And when revival comes to the church, and we quote Joel 2.28, it shall come to pass afterwards or in the last days, saith the Lord. I'll pour out my spirit. But you back up and read the verses before Joel 2.28. And one of the things that Joel cries is, let the priest weep between the porch and the altar. And could it be that we priests are too busy looking for the lost coin to look for the lost sheep? Oh, could it be that we've been caught up in a vortex of materialism? Oh, God in heaven, let the priest weep between the porch and the altar. That's not what Brother Tenney said. That's what the Word of God said. That teaches me that revival begins in the pulpit. Revival begins in the pulpit. Revival begins in the pulpit. <laughs> Turn us around, Lord. God, give us an uncompromising stand for the old basic truths that have made us what we are. Turn us around, God. Let something happen to us. Shake us, Lord. Somehow I feel that there are spirits out there that are tampering with the soul of the United Pentecostal Church. Any spirit that tells me I don't need my brother is not of God. We have been a continent of truth that have marched as a regimented army for 50 some odd years. I fear what will happen if we break away from this continent and become islands of conceit surrounded by seas of egotism. I need you, Brother Urshan. I need you, Brother Greer. I need you, Brother Wolf. Elder Volga, I need you. All of you laymen out there, we preachers need you. Will you turn around with us and ride behind King Jesus and the last day anointing of the Holy Ghost. Will you ride? Will you go? Will you hear me tonight? I'm talking about turning around. You know, it's so ironic and beautiful. And please hear me out. Just a few more seconds. Please listen to me. You need to hear what I've got to say. <laughs> God has raised up among us 
great men. They lived. They died. And they left behind great churches. And suddenly in prayer this week it dawned on me how that God has established across North America strategic center points of power and influence. Great churches that have a tremendous influence on everything and everybody around them. Not just preachers, but churches. And, oh, Lord, if these strategic centers, these old mother churches, if they can lift up the banner and the standard high in these last days, because, you see, they are either influences for good or for evil. For some reason unknown to me, the Lord has sent me back to a sheepfold in an area of southwest Louisiana to pastor a church that was founded in the year of 1913. The old mother church of that area. 63 years of glorious Pentecostal history. Many churches have been spawned from her. Many preachers have gone out. Brother George Glass that preached night before last came from that church. All of the Glass brothers out of First Church in DeWitter. Brother Arthur T. Morgan, our former general superintendent, was from that little town. And I, I, it dawned on me the influence of that old church for good or for evil. And God, I want to do everything I can to keep those sweet people that I pastor as a foundation of truth and holiness and righteousness. In these last days, I want their influence on our community and our brethren and our sister churches to be one for good and not for evil. And if we need to turn around, you see, Jesus said in the last days, the sea and the waves would roar. Roar, and you can't listen to the roar of the sea. That's the effect of the wind on the sea. And sea in the Bible is people. We've got to be sensitive enough not just to listen to the roar of the people or the waves, but we've got to listen to what the raw wind is saying. Oh, the people are going to roar, he said. The sea and the waves are going to roar. You're going to have voices out there that are going to move on you and speak to you and pressure you. But I don't want to just listen to the roar of the sea. I want to know what the Spirit says to the church. Oh, I don't want peer pressure and people pressure and society pressure and popularity pressure to turn me aside. But I want the old-fashioned five-fold anointing in these last days that's going to bring this church the greatest revival that we've known in history. God, as I look across and forgive me tonight, Forgive me for calling names, but as I look across our fellowship tonight and see the strategic centers that God has placed them. Oh, Brother David Gray, I think of that great old-fashioned church in San Diego overlooking that city on a hill at the end of a street called Pentecost Way. I know that old Revival Tabernacle is going to go with us as we turn our generation around. Coming up the coast of California, I come through so many blessed churches that love this truth. The old church at Stockton where we revere the memory of Brother Clyde Haney. Oh, Brother Haney, Brother Kim Haney, we're looking for Stockton to join us as we ride behind the king for this last day revival. And all the way up to Portland, Oregon, Brother Cool, the old first church in Portland, I know you're going to ride with us. And up to New Westminster, Brother Reynolds, uh, that old bastion of truth, uh, may her light shine in these last days uh, and start a revival on the western coast of Canada that will
burn eastward. And oh, Brother Stevenson, may Toronto be set afire with revival. Brother Cooling, may all of Ontario be set afire. Brother Johnny Mean from Halifax to Dartmouth to Fredericton to Moncton and down into Maine, Brother Kennedy, let the old-fashioned revival message be clarion. Neither is there salvation in any other, for this none has a name under heaven given among men. Oh, as I think about the eastern coast and its needs and the old seedbed of truth at 92nd Street and the old church at Foxborough, landmarks of the truth, Brother Cook, will they join with us in the old-fashioned anointing as we ride behind the king. Brother Stewart, Brother Chambers, in the memory of Brother Witherspoon, may that fine church Calvary in Columbus continue to be the apostolic center that it's always been. Brother Urshan, we need you in these days as never before. Young men like myself are looking to you at Calvary Tabernacle to lead the way and to save us from this untoward generation. Will you do it? Oh, I think about our tremendous churches in Illinois. I come to 13th and Cravoy where we revere the memory in the city of St. Louis of Brother Harry Brandon. Brother Paul, will you join with us as we ride behind the king in the old-fashioned way these last days?